Okay. <clears throat> so there's a there's the title, and I uh, hope you've seen it. And this is uh, pretty much what I want to get through today. Um, uh, surveying a project that has been in, in process for three or four years, uh, and it has to do with technology. And since technology has this shelf life of lettuce, uh, that means that keep having to adjust as the technology adjusts. So it's, uh, it's, it's been, for me anyway, a lot of fun. Uh, what are the field trips that we're going to move into uh, Google Earth, and why would we want to do it? Uh, we've been going on these field trips literally ever since I got here. Michelle and I, or Michelle or I, take students and once and, uh, over and over. Uh, we've gone since well before 2004, but we didn't have digital images then. So these are the earliest pictures I had. Uh, I particularly like this field trip because the person leading it is Kathy Schrady, who was at the time the full professor and chair of the department at St. Lawrence University. She's a structural geologist and one of my former students. So, uh, you know, I like that field trip particularly. Uh, people go on these field trips. This one is in Buffalo. Uh, typically, they're a two-day field trip. Uh, students, faculty, professional geologists, hobbyists, everybody's welcome. You come and you spend two days, go out where someone has decided that they have some good trips to lead. Typically, there are a half a dozen, maybe a dozen trips each day. And you can only do one trip each day. So most of us, even those that go on these trips, don't get to go on most of those trips. Okay, when you do go on these trips, sometimes the, uh, the hiking is strenuous, and therefore people with mobility issues are unable to attend. People who have schedules that don't permit them to take a weekend off, or they have uh, family um, responsibilities, can't attend, and those people who are institutionalized in hospitals, nursing homes, or prisons can't attend either. And uh, one of the reasons to put all of these field trips into virtual format is so that anyone can sit at their computer and get part of the experience of the field trip. Putting field trips into virtual format has been going on since uh, the internet was uh, invented, more or less. Uh, but with Google Earth, we now have really easy ways to do it and really easy ways to follow it. So that's, that's what happened. OK, so uh, here's one more slide. This one is at the end of a day. Uh, people are a little tired, and, and Bill Kelly is telling us we're at the Haas up in the Adirondacks, and he's telling us about the 52 million tons of high-grade magnetite ore left in the ground there because uh, no one could mine it profitably, and I'll come back to that some other day. All right. Uh, we've been taking students, sometimes lots, sometimes not too many. Uh, sometimes we camp, sometimes we stay in hotels. Uh, whenever we've come back, the students have always told us it was a great experience. Okay. On the trip to Buffalo that I showed you that slide, uh, Michelle and I went over there to a, a trip that uh, a gentleman from SUNY Buffalo named Jason Greiner was leading. And Jason Greiner and Dick Young, uh, we got out to where the field trip started, and they handed us a CD with the field trip on Google Earth. And obviously, you're not going to use it in the field, but when we got home, there it was with Google Earth place marks. And I said, whoa, that's the way all of these should be, OK? And so then I went and I harassed uh, Alan Benamoff for the next two years. I said, is anyone doing this? Why, why isn't someone putting all of these on? And what I really wanted to make sure, if I was going to put in all that time and effort putting them on Google Earth, that somebody over in Albany wasn't already doing it, right? And we don't need to duplicate our effort. And he assured me, oh, no, nobody's doing it. And Bill Kelly, who you saw it in that previous picture, he was the uh, state geologist and uh, really the, the, the person in charge of maintaining all the records for the field trips. And he said, you really should do this, Otto. You really should do this. So I had a big cheerleader. I had Alan Benamoff, who was executive secretary of the, of the New York State Geological Association, all pushing me. And I said, OK, OK, I'll do some. Yeah. So I started off uh, 2009 putting a few simple trips on uh, just to see if it was going to work and how much work was involved. And then I went to a Northeast GSA, that's what that uh, acronym stands for, where I gave my first progress report, in part to see if Alan was right and nobody else was doing this, in part to get input about how I was doing it wrong, uh, and in part to just see, you know, was there a lot of interest in this or not. So the, uh, these are the guidebooks. These are old ones. Those are new ones. Uh, but those are two-dimensional pictures. And what you really don't see is these are, are old ones. 
that many pages, and these are new ones. So uh, we have, uh, like many other issues, uh, many other concerns, uh, increased the, the number of field trips, the number of words printed in the field trips, and everything else. But uh, they've been going on now for 55 years, but that's OK. Uh, if you look at the ones I did first, uh, not surprisingly, I, I did the, the last time there was a New York State Geological field trip in Alfred uh, was uh, 1957, okay? Uh, we don't have the infrastructure or personnel to actually pull this off. And that was another reason I thought, gee, you know, what could we do? We could play with the computer all day, and, and so that's what I've been doing. So those squiggly lines are the field trips that were led in 57. A bunch were led from Binghamton in 63, and another bunch up here out of uh, Union College in 65, just more or less testing the market. The market is kind of big. This is the list of those field trips available by 2009, and three little check marks for where I'd gotten at that time. Um, and I went and I gave this, this talk, as I mentioned. Uh, these are all free, and there's plans now to make the 70s free. And then after that, 30 bucks a pop for, for this stuff. Another reason to do this is that these, these field trip guides are, are available if you happen to be in New York State. You happen to go to a library. Hi, Matt. Uh, and uh, check in the library on almost any geology campus. We'll ha they will have a collection of these field guides. But if you're in Texas, you're out of luck. And uh, it's, not, it's not easy to get a hold of them. So I thought, OK, let's see if we can get them out there. When you actually do it, this is that early work. These are the stops along the way. This is an example of what the field guide looks like, okay? TypeScript, particularly those early ones. Hand, I, some of you probably don't know, but we used to have typewriters, and there were two different kinds, electric, that were pretty consistent in how hard they hit. And then the manual ones, and it depended on the secretary and what mood she was in, uh, how hard she hit those, uh, those letters. And so when you're trying to convert it using some kind of uh, optical character recognition, it becomes a, an interesting project right there. OK, so this would be how the field trip would be. And then if you've never played with Google Earth, I'll just tell you, you have a, a, an ability to put things inside of folders. So the big folder would be for the whole trip, 1957. And then each one of the trips in there, A, B, C, D, E. Uh, you'll notice C is the Sinclair Oil Refinery. I don't think Gary Osterer was here when that was in operation. He was? OK, all right. <laughs> So uh, in any event, there's some old things on here. Uh, I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. Uh, and we have all those different field trips, and each field trip has a number of stops. And then they have this path. And so the idea is you follow the, uh, the directions in the guidebook using Google Earth. And it, to me, it's a lot uh, like, not very much different from doing crossword puzzles. I, uh, I get totally lost in it. I am there going from outcrop to outcrop. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's not that different from being there in the real world to me, but it depends on your, your imagination. So the first iteration of this then would take the name of the field trip, okay, Station 9 in Whitesville, and, and then I put in New York State Geological Association 1957 Trip E. And I thought that was pretty good, all right? My thinking was I wanted to know what year it was because geology, like everything else, is constantly changing. And one of the beautiful things about us is our, our archives are the rocks. Okay, So anyone who wants to go back to the archives, all they have to do is go back to that outcrop, and you can look at it yourself and make your own interpretations. And what is delightful is to read the interpretations done in the 50s and 60s, and then read them in the 70s and 80s, and then read them now. People are looking at the same rocks with different ideas, and they're seeing different things as always believing is seeing, and, uh, and then they, they write up their descriptions. And I find that by itself is just really fascinating, um, and even the vocabulary changes and everything else. OK. So the field trip guides, there's another example of the guides. They have stops that have numbers on them. But depending on the trip, many of them also have lots of stops in between. They typically run in cars. If it's a very popular field trip, they'll rent buses. But usually, that's expensive, and they like to keep it cheap. So they'll take a string of cars. You'll be going along, one person driving, somebody else reading from the field guide and saying, oh, if you look off to the right, you'll see an esker. It doesn't matter whether you know what an esker is or not, but there it is. So you know, it's not really a stop. I call them views. And I include them just as I do with the stops. We have these stops and views. And, 
it turns out that a lot of that information is, is there, and particularly on the, on the field trips that have to do with the shape of the Earth and the erosional things that are left and those sorts of things, those, those views can be just as, as interesting as the actual stops. In the early days, and again, I'm talking about how this evolved, uh, what I was planning was that people could take these stops. Any one of those stops can be moved. You can make your own field trip. Google built all of that in, so anybody can move a stop from any field trip to any other field trip and you know, customize it and, and just have a ball. And as long as you're in that name field, that very first field up there, Google will let you search for it. So if you had a name field there where it, which had Alfred and Sio and Wellsville, it would easily be able to find Sio. When I gave this presentation, uh, there was a strong uh, encouragement to include a little bit more information that was searchable. And this, is, uh, this was how it moved on. Um, in the meantime, though, here's your Sinclair refinery, which is now the Wellsville campus. And in between was a hazardous waste site. Okay. Uh, and because I know, since I've been there, that the refinery isn't there anymore, uh, I put some modifications in as I'm adding the stuff. If I put a modification in, I put it in in blue. The, uh, the text, the, everything formatted in these, these balloons is all easily formatted with CSS and HTML. And if you don't know what that is, it's not hard to learn. And, and there you go. Um, and there you go. Sorry. OK. Uh, if there, this is the, uh, the, the place just, just south of Pennsylvania. A lot of you don't know. We pump a lot of gas into the ground in, in New York State because uh, uh, it, we pumped it out some time ago, and it, it's better back in there. No, the reality is that our pipelines are at capacity during the wintertime. They're not in the summertime, so it's cheaper to pump the gas up from Texas in the summertime, put it down in the ground. And this is what one of those facilities looks like. That's a road for scale. This is really big. And that's still right there. And still, this is a current Google Earth picture. Uh, obviously, when they went there on this field trip, they didn't want people smoking where they were pumping gas into the ground. OK. Uh, the next step then to, uh, to try and get this searchable, I wanted to move it into a database. And I'm a Mac person, and the database we had in the division was FileMaker in order to translate the stops, which are in a, in a XML variant called KML, have to translate them into FileMaker speak, which was a learning experience. But I got there, and uh, I was really pleased that I was able to do that. Okay, And uh, then Marion Weaver invited me to come over and give a talk at the Southern Tier BOCES to a bunch of earth science teachers. And I thought, yeah, this is cool. Wouldn't it be nice? If all of the earth science teachers would get on board, and each earth science section in each school would adopt a few of these outcrops, okay, and then take pictures of the outcrops, go out and make measurements, uh, add to the database. And Marion thought it was a good idea when I gave the talk. They thought it was a good idea, uh, and they said. Oh, and by that time, I had produced a blog, okay. I don't know if any of you have ever done a blog, uh, but they have, they're a mixed bag. So I put this blog together. I demoed it at this BOCES talk, and literally all of the, all of the earth science teachers said, oh, this is great. What a cool idea. Let's get on it. Over the next year or so, the blog had 100 entries, more than 100 entries, actually quite a few more than 100 entries put into it. One was not spam. Every single other entry on that blog was spam. And every time you get a few dozen, the, uh, the, you, know, you get sort of some pressure. I should go in and clean out the spam. And you just spend a lot of time taking the spam out. So I took the blog down eventually, but not for a while. The other thing that had happened in these intervening years is that we had moved to smartphones. Obviously, if you have a smartphone, you want to be able to use the same Google Earth stuff. Google Earth makes the, the uh, Google Earth Mobile here, OK? Uh, and that's how it looks on a map. However, it meant reformatting some of the style things. And that was, again, something that could be done. But it was you know, one of those unexpected complications. While I have this up, you'll notice some of it is in, in uh, italics. And I did that with the following idea that if you're looking for a particular fossil, yes? 
Uh, maybe you want to find all the spots that have fossils because you happen to be a, uh, a hobbyist interested in fossils or a teacher interested in fossils. So all of them are in italics, and then if you search for italics, I'll show you in just a second, uh, it pops up just those spots, and, and uh, that's why I did that. Uh, also because people, in the old days, they underlined everything that's now in italics. That's just to make it very hard to do OCR. Nowadays, they put them in real italics, okay? So, uh, we went on from there. I, uh, after that meeting and the response I got there, and at that meeting, I met a, a gentleman named Declan Dupois, who was organizing a, um, a conference at the Googleplex in Menlo Park. And uh, he said, why don't you submit this to see if people in the conference are interested in hearing what you're doing? And I said, yeah, okay, so fine. And then they accepted it. And then the, uh, the uh, folks in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences found some faculty development funding for me. And I went, and I had a great time. And if you were at the ENVS seminar on the 11th, 11, 11, 2011, uh, I gave that talk. And I'm not going to repeat that here. And at that talk, I didn't say much of what I'm talking about here. I tried to keep them distinct. But it's online as a PDF. Uh, mostly. Some of the links aren't there, but the rest of it's pretty good. Okay, and this is a Penrose conference. The Geological Society of America has always had Penrose conference, not always, but has had them for a long time. The original pot of money was intended to take a bunch of people with a particular interest and expertise and lock them up. Okay, they typically would be in some mountain resort where they would lock them up for three days and they would talk about whatever that subject was. And it's a cool way of getting people to, uh, to interact because they're locked into the space. Most of the money's gone. They didn't get much funding from GSA for this, but they were still required, if they were going to use that name, to lock us up. So the idea, we had to be in the same hotel. We had to be together um, 24 hours a day. And that was great. I mean, we all got along. It wasn't a problem. But I did find it funny because they're locking us up in Menlo Park. It's not a secluded uh, mountain resort, but, you know, it worked. And I, I had a great time, and I learned a whole lot. And one of the things that I, I had no idea before I went there, again, recall I was putting things in FileMaker. I got there, and we all had to produce our poster session, and I had my poster there. Again, it was really funny. Some of the people that were there were my age. You can look here. Some, some of them are. They came over, oh, I remember that trip. Uh, Ernie Muller, no relation to me. Ernie Muller led that trip. Oh, it was just great. And they, they were really interested in, in the field trips, and they could remember them clearly. So, uh, you know, that was kind of cool. But the idea of having FileMaker do your sorting, all right? So I say, all right, I want all of the, the trips that have fossils in them that uh, were led by so-and-so. And, and FileMaker would kick that out. And then I could export that as a Google Earth KML file. And anyone could use it. And I demoed this. And they said, oh, you know, that's cool. These people said that's cool. The Google people said, duh. That's so last year, OK? What we have now is Google Fusion Tables. I said, Google what? And they said, Fusion Tables. And I said, oh. And then, I, then we had some uh, classes on Fusion Tables. And I said, you know, this is the answer to all of this, OK? So we moved along. I then spent a lot more time. I had a sabbatical, so I was able to put a lot of data into the system. I was able to convert it into this Google table format. And it now is up there as Google tables. And uh, I, think it's, I think it's a huge improvement over what was there before. OK. So I moved along. This was uh, for that second conference that I went to. And I said, OK, this is the progress that we're making. And we've changed, by the way. We're now on uh, these fusion tables. And those are the ones I've done since then. I've done several more of these. Uh, this one from Rutgers at 400 pages. And that wasn't even TypeScript. That was, those were printed pages. It was, that was a bear, but, uh, and, and, and some other ones in here. So I'm still making progress, but I have uh, plenty to keep me busy for the foreseeable future. And uh, we're going to now look at this fusion table interface. All right. So. What do we do? This is, the, this is the nitty gritty of the talk. If you're interested in how you move field trips from one format into another, uh, here we are. So we have several different ways in which we input the data. Early hard copies, OK, like I showed you, a lot of these have never been 
put in any kind of electronic format. The New England Intercollegiate Geologic Conference, NEIGC, meets usually in New England, and they have also an annual field trip. They're very involved in putting them into a PDF format, okay, and it's something else going on. So, you know, many of us are thinking that all of these will eventually be available on a, on a searchable database, and you would be able to combine them. Some of the New York trips are off, have been offered in the past in, as, as dual trips, so some of them are both. Um, they are busy, hard at work. Uh, there's a librarian in New Hampshire who is putting all of their field trips into PDF format, but doesn't do anything more than that. So some of our early ones are in PDF. Some of the early ones are hard copy. If they're hard copy, we scan them. And then in either case, the PDFs that are out there, for those who are uh, thinking about old documents, they're not text, right? They come out as an image. And then you have to take that image, and if you're going to search it, you have to be able to turn it into text. And so that's what we call optical character recognition. And if we're looking at the non-fun part of this whole project, there it is, all right? The number of errors produced by optical character recognition, recognition is so great that many corporations never even think of it. They just put it in front of a secretary and they type it in again. It's a lot easier. Just look at that image and type. But it's also, it, I feel like my, my background is useful here, that I know most of the geologic jargon and, and how to spell many of the words. And so, you know, it's something that uh, I, I think, oh, I'm actually doing something useful here. More recent PDFs from the 90s and this century, typically those are, first of all, text to read. But second of all, because I, Alan Benamoff and, and, and Bill Kelly are involved in this, they just send me the originals in Word, okay? And that, when I ever get to them, is going to be real easy. So I won't have to do the optical character recognition. So this is taking the descriptions, that side. This is taking how did we get where we were, the other side. And still, that's playing with Google Earth and finding where the roads were or are. Allegheny County, we're lucky. Most of, well, some of us think we're lucky. Most of our roads are the same as they were in the 1950s, okay? But if you get over towards Syracuse, uh, there is a lot of construction, a lot of suburbs that have changed a lot of the roads. And so you're constantly going back to old geologic, or, I'm sorry, topographic maps, trying to figure out where you are. And then you make your uh, uh, Google Earth path by following these along and figure out where each one of the stops was and each one of the views was. So all of them need to do this. Then you combine them all to get some kind of a, of a final formed uh, thing that you, that, that you have ready to go. Now, that was the input. And here you got, this is, this is everything is ready now. <coughs> Depending on where you want to send it, if you're going to send it up to fusion tables, you've got to convert it into a comma-separated values table, which I still use that file maker to do. It turns out that since I was doing this, the, uh, the, the technology has evolved. Excel can now export pretty directly to this. So if you're starting from scratch, don't go the FileMaker route. See what you can do with the Excel. There's lots of templates to do this uh, that way. But in any event, you come from your KML file to something else to send it up to Fusion Tables. Okay? And then Fusion Tables has it. I'll show you that in a second. That's, this is where everybody can use it. Everybody can download it. Everybody can add to it and fuse it, and fuse their database with yours. However, I wasn't going to give up my original project, was, which was to make uh, standalone files that each one represented the thing. So this is not hard to do. And if you are putting it on a desktop, you go that way. If you're changing all the styles so it fits on your phone, you go this way. But those aren't really difficult things. And then the website has both of those, and the Fusion Tables has the other. OK. Where are we now? All right, at this point, we've done 3,052 3, place marks, covered a lot of the state, 159 field trips in 21 guidebooks. And I'm not halfway there yet. <laughs> but what the heck? Uh, you know, it's more fun than a crossword puzzle. Uh, you can download any portion of these. You can, you can doctor them up. You can do anything you like. But that's, that's where we are. And of course, if you zoom in, you'll see that, that uh, and I, I intentionally am not using Google Earth today because I wanted everything to work. 
So it's just a simple PowerPoint thing. All right. Um, uh, they, they probably signify different trips in a given year. I've formatted it so many different ways, Matt, um, and it's so easy to change them that I can't tell you for sure, but that's my guess. Um, so you get on fusion tables and you want to do this searching that I talked about. Again, the example that I set you up for, if you search in the description field for that guy, and that is your HTM markup that says italicized and it's actually deprecated, they now like to use EM for emphasized, for those who are doing those sorts of things. I use that on purpose because it is deprecated and so it's not so likely that other people would use it. In any event, that means that there is the name of a fossil, anything that I did in here that has that as its modifier will be a fossil. And then I picked those that were led by a friend of mine, Bruce Selleck. And this is the list that then pops out, okay? And this is the table format. If you get into Google uh, Fusion Tables, you can visualize. And you can, it's not just maps. You can visualize graphs, charts, there's 86,000 different things that people do. I'm just talking about the, the map output. So then you hit visualize as a map, and here you go. Those are the stops, okay? There aren't that many of them. And then this is the, uh, the balloon that pops up. Uh, some of these balloons, the biggest one I think had 2,500 words. Uh, most of them are smaller than that. There's no limit, right? You've got a slide bar. You can put as much in there as you want. Um, and again, you can format your, your stuff with different names. You can make this, you can really make this as, as, as uh, elaborate as you want to. One of, the, one of the things that you can do in Fusion Tables is you can link another table to it as long as you have a keyword from both. All right, so if you had the stop number, all right, um, on this guy, you could, let me just go back, eh, maybe not. Okay, that's all right. If you go with it, if, if you fuse it, they call it fuse it, I don't know. You, you just link some other uh, table to it. You can have a table with anything you want for those same stops and merge them together, all right? Anyone putting data up there can release it to the public. They can release it to people who know the, the, uh, the link address. They can keep it totally private. They can release it to whatever group of people they want. And, uh, you know, all of that's cool. You can download all of my data, all 3,052 spots, put it on your desk, play whatever games you want to with it. Okay, so I, as an experiment, put on this. Okay, here's a spot many of you may know. There's the map. Genesee River, there's Sio. Okay, there we go, Vandermark Road, yes? And if you've been on that road, I am certain you saw this beautiful outcrop, one of the best outcrops we had to deal with, yes? All right, and so I took a picture of it, stuck it on here. If you open this up in Google Earth or in Fusion Tables, either one, and then you click on that picture, you get to see the big picture on the web, okay? The, the only caveat is that your pictures have to be on the web somewhere and they have to be accessible to whoever you have given permission to for the site. So for my sites, they're all open to anybody. Uh, go click on that, you'll get to the big picture. At one point, it was also in the, in the, uh, in the blog and all that jazz. One other little tidbit, the, uh, the, this is not uncommon in these field trips. Many of the leaders of these field trips use them as repositories for data that most publications don't accept anymore, all right? Uh, so we, we end up with some fairly lengthy things that very good scientists have put in there, uh, and this would be the stratigraphic section at that particular outcrop. And we have a lot of them, and I can tell you, those all have to be then formatted as HTML tables in order to look this way. Uh, it is not, I haven't found any way to OCR those tables uh, without spending a lot of time and effort doing this, but it still ends up being fine, okay, and there you go. Um, as, as we've moved through, I've also added additional metadata, okay? The metadata that we had before was the, the year and the field trip. I now have a stop, and the stop will have, uh, if it's one of those regular stops, it would be like stop 3.00. And if it's one of the views between stop 3 and stop 4, it would be stop 3.01, 0.02, 0.026, 0.28. There's sometimes a lot of those stops. The point then is that if you're clicking on something, you can figure out exactly what field trip it was. And then I've also added the field trip leaders. 
And part of the reason for this is sometimes you get some wackos out there leading these field trips, and I just don't believe a word they say. And I assume that there's other people out there that don't believe a word they say either, and they're just going to dispense with them when they see that name. Uh, but I put them all in. I don't, I don't filter them, yeah? Okay. So, all right, so I got rid of the blog. All right? It's not there anymore, and it didn't seem to be useful. The Google Fusion tables used to have equivalent blogs. They used to have a space there that anyone looking at it could put comments. And Google has been burned, okay, with too many people using that for spam. And they said, you know, we're taking this down. It's something that we, uh, we thought was a good idea, but maybe it isn't as good an idea as we thought. If you really want this, please email to us. Okay, and that brings up the real problem with, the, with committing yourself to Google. We all love Google, but they're currently in the news because their uh, informal model, mo motto, don't be evil, is now questioned by lots of people because they are doing things that people think makes them look like any other gigantic corporation. And as we know, Google is a corporation and they're trying to make a buck. If it turns out Google Fusion Tables doesn't make them any money after it's out there for a while, it's entirely up to them. They can take it down, right? Bummer. So uh, I was talking to John Hosgrove, is that his name? Hos Hosford, librarian, yeah. John Hosford about uh, this before today. And he was, his concern is that if you commit to Google, you're making a mistake because they may disappear. And that's something to keep in the back of your head. What I would argue is, right now it's darn convenient, let's use it. Um, but in the meantime, we can take our output, you can take the output that's up there today and use it in other ways. You can bring it back and still use all the file maker sorting that we had before. We're never going to have to give that up. And then we can use it in, uh, we can use those KML files in any other kind of, of uh, geographical information system that we want. So, for instance, Justin's uh, ARC stuff will import all these KMLs with all that data. So the data is in a format that anybody can do. Putting it up on Google is a nice, fun way to, to play with it. Uh, but if we went ahead, this is not ARC. This is another GIS thing. Uh, just to put it in perspective, all right. This is the J Jason Briner trip, that blue one. That's what started it all. If you know about where we are, there's Wellsville. Okay, those are some stops in the 1957 trip. There's Happy Valley. No, Happy Valley now, I understand it's Pennsylvania. I used to call this Happy Valley because of the ski slope. But in any event, there's Al, uh, where was I? There's Alfred, okay. Uh, there goes the Genesee River. What we've done here is taken a digital elevation map, that's what the DEM stands for, tilted it so we got rid of uh, the post-glacial uplift, okay. So back before the, the post-glacial uplift, everything was down a lot, and, and for lots of reasons that's fun to do. We can do that. We put on top of it all those colors are the superficial geology. We take that off another map. So it's a mashup, independent of Google. That's the big point of this. Google is not involved with any of this at all. It's, uh, it's Avenza is the company that I was using, but Justin could do exactly the same thing with his stuff, probably a little bit better. Uh, and now you've got all your field trips with all the stops on this kind of a map so that you're putting in, uh, in a context in, in, in terms of what people might be using it for. Yes? Okay. I think I hear what some of you are saying really loud and clear. Other than the hour's late, you better stop talking. Okay. Uh, some of you are saying, but what happens to all of that information that you put in about the stops? This is actually on what we call a geo PDF. It's the same as an Adobe PDF. But if you go to your Adobe PDF and it is one of these, it will have a separate kind of, why didn't that go forward? Oh, there we go. Okay. It'll have a, um, a separate tool in the PDF under analysis called your object data tool. And if you take that object data tool, and again, I emphasize we're not in Google, and you click on that spot, and you look over here, there is all the attribute data for that spot, which would include the metadata and the description of the, the thing and everything else. So bottom line is, if you were dealing with a non-Google world or you were dealing with people who didn't like Google or whatever, you could output it this way, send it on to them, and, uh, and hopefully they'd be able to use it. The other thing, obviously, is that once you have it in a PDF, you no longer need any access to the web. 
So you can use it out in the field in your lap book, your, your whatever, and, uh, and, and be good. Okay. So if you have any interest in pursuing this further, the guidebooks are all there. Uh, the fusion table, so the fusion table I used here is right there. All you have to do is click on that, take you right there. Uh, you can download it if you want, save it, whatever. Um, all of my other data that has to do with the, the KMZ files that I made for all of those years and everything else by themselves, sitting there by themselves, are there. And the talk that I gave last uh, November for the environmental studies folks is there. Okay? And I think I gave myself some time for questions. Is that right, Bill? Do we have any questions? 